Welcome, everybody. Um, I think I'll be present knows who I am, David Stevens. I'm chairman of the committee, um, but for members of the public, if they're already watching, um, then uh, obviously welcome to our um, meeting this evening. Um, social distance rules still in place, so councillors continue to meet on this video conferencing platform instead of a meeting in person um, at the civic offices. Coronavirus Act 2020 allows local authority committees to be conducted online, attended remotely by members and officers. Um, the public and the press will be able to see and hear the meeting. Um, the agenda papers have been published on the council's website and the modern, modern, I still can't say it, modern government app. Um, and these papers will be considered by members this evening. Um, members attended have been asked to introduce themselves shortly um, and this will ensure they're all present um, uh, as expected and they can hear and speak to the meeting and also for the benefit of the public. Um, the committee rarely asks or requires formal votes but if necessary I'll ask members individually at the end of the debate if we need a for or against. I, I think probably again it's not necessary but we will say that if, we, if it's necessary we'll do it. Um, when it comes to simply noting a report, I'll just ask for consent and agreement um, from you all. When not speaking, please everybody turn your microphones to mute. And when called, obviously unmute your microphone first, pause for three seconds um, and then speak. And obviously recognise that you know, we're on personal broadband, so if people drop out, so be it. Um, but as long as there are three of us present, we'll call it and we continue the meeting. OK, so I'll now do the roll call of the councillors. As you see your name, please introduce yourselves um, and state your name and any position you hold. So I'm David Stevens. I'm the chairman of the committee. Um, and actually, they put down here, I'm mayor of Reading as well. But that's not really relevant to this evening's either proceedings. Um, other members, Councillor Davis. Um, my name's Richard Davis. Um, I'm uh, vice chair of this uh, Wooded Governors Committee. I'm also, uh, I'm also the consort of the deputy mayor. Very good. Um, Councillor Edwards. Oh, hi, I'm Councillor Debs Edwards, uh, Southcote Ward. I'm uh, not only a member of this committee, but I chair the licensing committee. I also sit on the fostering panel and I have other roles within the council. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, Councillor Emerson. Yeah, Councillor oh, Emerson and the lead councillor for corporate and consumer services. Good. Um, Councillor Giddings. It's Paul Gittings, I'm a Minister Ward Councillor. I chair the Strategic Environment Planning and Transport Committee. Very good, thank you. Councillor McKenna. Councillor Emmett McKenna of Very Whitley good. Ward and also chair of the Planning Applications Committee. Very good. Um, Councillor Simon Robinson. He good evening, up. Chair. Councillor Simon Robinson representing Peppard Ward. Excellent. Um, and finally, Councillor Josh Williams. Good evening, Chair. Uh, yeah, Josh Williams representing Park Ward. Excellent. So we have a full house. Um, we also have, I think, with us Councillor Brock, leader of the council, who's attending as an observer. Um, and just to introduce you as they're here, uh, we have um, Jackie Yates, who's our Executive Director of Resources. Good evening, Jackie. Um, we have Mr Harrington, Paul Harrington, who's the Chief Auditor. Um, Peter Robinson who is the Assistant Director of Finance. Um, Annette, hopefully Annette Trigg, I think I saw her come up um, as the Chief Accountant, and Stuart Donnelly, Financial Planning and Strategy Manager. Um, finally, do we have Chris Tidswell as well with us? Not sure, okay, well, if we do, Chris Tidwell from SIPFA. And also we have Mike Graham, who's Assistant Director for Legal and Democratic Services, as well as the Monitoring Officer. Um, and then I think lastly, no, not quite, um, Michael Popham's Democratic Service Manager, who will be taking the minutes this evening. Um, and then we have from our external orders EY, um, Maria Grinley, who will be joining a bit later. And we have currently Adrian Barmer, who I can see. So welcome, Adrian. OK, so we move to the first um, item on the business and agenda. And I'll take, I'll take it steadily. Hopefully everybody else can as do as I'm doing, sort of juggling between screens. Um, but if, if, we, if we're going too fast, just uh, ask me to pause and we can uh, stop for a moment for people. Um, so the first one is declarations of interest. Does anybody have a declaration they wish to, to do or an item they wish to declare? So we'll take that as none. Two is item. So the minutes of the last meeting. Um, so our last meeting was one second on the 12th of October 
And I was looking through those. And again, somebody else jump in if you want to comment on these. But um, obviously, again, they're quite lengthy. But there were a couple of items I noticed that were asking to bring reports back to this meeting. Um, so one was the control risks identified in relation to payroll, mosaic and so on. Um, we said it was a report be submitted to the next meeting, i.e. tonight. So I think we need to, to pick that up. Um, and the second point, and I think this might be a part two item, we asked that a report be submitted at this meeting on the financial implications of COVID-19 on Reading buses. Um, and again, I think we're going to have to pick that up probably at the end of the meeting in part two. Peter, can you just confirm that? Peter Robinson. Sorry, sorry about that. Sorry, I have my, I have my camera and my mic off. So sorry, yeah, sorry, okay. yeah, yes, that's right. Yeah. So, okay, so you'll pick that up, I think, at the end. All right. So the rest of the minutes um, I thought were fine. There was nothing else I picked up when we were coming back to this meeting. So if people are happy, we have to regard those as a true record of the last minute of um, this particular meeting. All those in favour? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Agreed. OK, so item three is questions we have none received and therefore we go to item four, which is the internal audit quarterly progress report. Um, and that's going to be introduced to us by Mr Harrington. Thank you, Chair. I um, hope everyone can hear me. I've been having a few IT problems today. Um, hopefully I'll stay I can, I can, I can stable. see and hear you. Good, good stuff. Right, OK, so this is my standard um, quarterly update report, which I provide to this committee every quarter. So this particular report um, summarises those audits completed in quarter three and progress. Um, uh, the investigations team have also made in that quarter. So I'm going to work on the assumption that everyone's read the report and I'm just going to talk through the um, limited assurance uh, review. So we finalised five audits during this period, three of which were assigned a limited assurance opinion. First one, um, purchase cards, which is on Appendix 1. So the main report is Appendix 1 um, in this pack, and it's page 16 hey. of okay. your bundle, so purchase cards. So we found here a, a lack of adherence to policies and procedures. Um, we found that controls hadn't been followed in all instances. For example, um, cards were, we found um, evidence of cards being shared. Um, we found uh, on two occasions, two instances, purchase cards had not been returned when the card holder had left and they were continuing to be used by the service. And whilst these transactions were genuine and authorised, you know, these, these are basic controls which protect not only the council, but, um, but card holders against misuse and fraud. So mm. testing identified expenditure throughout the, um, through a purchase card, which should have been made via a purchase order or through payroll, such as travel and assistance. Um, and we find the whole process very, very cumbersome, very, very resource intensive. Um, and for that reason, we, we made 15 recommendations and I know none were considered as priority one given the volume of recommendations made, it was given an overall limited assurance opinion. Second limited assurance reviews on- So to just put a pause on that one, so I suspect oh, yes. you might want to have a word sure. about that. I mean, it does seem concerning that it obviously has the high potential for, for fraud or misuse. And we're saying that the controls really aren't working as effectively. It's one of those ones that comes back to bite us and people say, why on earth you know, was it not properly controlled? So, so what do the managers in the area say about it? You say they're difficult to, to manage and, and impose the controls. That doesn't well, seem to me like a sufficiently sort of good answer. No, the, so the, the response to the 15 very recommendations was very, very comprehensive and we're quite and we're, we're very pleased with the response. And I can probably state that a lot of those recommendations, which you will see later on on the audit tracker, have already been implemented. And I know there's been a new electronic workflow introduced, which really, really does help. So I've confidence that the recommendations will be addressed. They were all agreed to. None of them um, were, were disputed. And it's just a matter of, well, let's get them done. And then we'll come back and follow up to make sure they've been implemented. OK, so that's reassuring. Um, Richard Davis, you're indicating. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair. Yeah, 
Um, I mean, it's good to hear uh, that reassuring words at the end there from uh, Paul Arrington. Um, can I just ask, were these really um, to do with the fact that the cards was a kind of easier way to spend certain amounts of money rather than going through sort of more, we might call more rigorous processes and more sort of onerous kind of processes in the council. And it was kind of a, just became a sort of, you know, quicker, quicker way to, to get what the council needed to get done, sort of subverting the purchase order kind of process. Really. Is that, is that more the characterising it? Yeah. In, in short, yes. You know, obviously the, the, the whole purpose of, of purchase cards is for small value transactions. You know, it's less, less than £50. And in the majority of cases, that's what they're used for. But there was some evidence that we believe that they were being used to circumnavigate the, the official yeah. process, which is a purchase order or through um, uh, payroll expenses. Yeah. Yeah, so does that, sorry... Can I just? No, Carol, Carol, Carol. Yeah. Does that mean that the, does that imply any weak, any sort of weakness in the in the proper process? Or the, is the proper process then too difficult to? Do you know what I mean? Is, is, have we have we made that too hard so people are trying to find ways around it? Yeah. Yeah, I think the proper process as it was was very very cumbersome. It was a very very it was a it was effectively a paper based process which was replicated on, on email. It was a very very cumbersome process. Um, I think that has been been improved with new electronic workflows, and that will speed things up. But but I do think that yeah, if people have got a choice of a raising a PO, yeah. and finding a supplier, using a supplier, and using a purchase card, then they're going to use a purchase card because it is a quicker quicker yeah. process. Is it, is it the whole thing isn't really about um, dishonesty or anything? It's about um, just just the easy path to getting your job done, really, isn't it? That's right, but but there were some obvious transactions which should have been done via an official purchase order. Yeah. So, so okay. this is obviously one specific aspect of of paying for things. Card. Are there other sort of mechanisms like this out there? This is just one, or is this just this is the only other way that people can go about sort of spending council money? Yeah, well, the two main um, ways of doing it at the moment are purchase orders and um, purchase cards. So these, these these are a form of a of a yeah. visa card, and they should have restrictions built into them. So they can use them for activities relating to their job, but they can't use them for other activities. And some of those criteria haven't been um, haven't been implemented, haven't mm. been acted. But what what you've ordered is the entirety of purchase cards. There are not other sort of similar schemes or arrangements out there that. Gosh, with this happening here and people trying to convert, uh, circumvent the main purchase order system, are there other ways they could do it? And we would then uncover those, or is this it? This is the only one that they could try and do, use. This, this is the main one. Okay, okay. All right. So, anybody else? No. So, please, Paul, move on to the next one. Okay, thank you, Chair. So, the next one is um, record management and document retention, which is on page 17. This flags several areas of concern that need appropriate consideration. Um, the fundamental issues are a lack of up to date, agreed records management and document retention policy, and a centralised register detailing records held across the Council, their format location and the responsible officers. So an up-to-date um, data retention policy should be in place to detail how long information should be retained for and how safely and securely um, we dispose of that information. Um, and information should not be retained for longer than necessary. Um, so a smarter working group has been established whose remit includes moving council information held on various sort of legacy systems um, legacy applications and storage devices to Office 365 applications such as SharePoint and OneDrive and this will help to address various policy requirements including ensuring consistency and structure to how data is managed. A total of eight recommendations were made, um, two were considered high priority and the full um, um, internal report is disclosed or attached as Appendix 4. Okay, and I understood that. Read that. There's not. There was nothing else. I had any questions about that. Anybody else? No. Doesn't look like it. No. So if we move on to the next one, which I think is okay. car parks. 
No, and the car parks is fine. I don't want, I'm just going to just gonna focus on the limited Reasonable. assurance. Oh, I see. Sorry, yes. Yeah. Yep. So I'm going to move on to page 20, yeah. um, which is the um, community infrastructure yeah. levy, the local schemes. Um, this audit was undertaken following concerns raised by members about the timely delivery of certain um, local schemes. And the Deputy Director of Planning, Transport and Regulatory Services requested an audit of a sample of projects to determine why these projects weren't delivered as agreed by policy committee in November 2018. And you know, we found that an absence of a complete control framework being in place to facilitate the timely use of the 15% local um, SIL money. And as a result, schemes were not being delivered on a timely basis. We didn't find any single reason um, for the poor delivery of schemes. Rather, it was our conclusion that there was a combination of system weaknesses and factors such as agreed procedures or the lack of agreed procedures and a lack of um, oversight that meant that schemes were not being achieved. And the deputy director has commented that officers responsible for those areas could have sought clarity, engaged with planning colleagues and members on their projects. And so a degree of personal responsibility needs um, to be accepted. So in response to the concerns raised, uh, they've taken a number of steps uh, to address these weaknesses. And these in conjunction with the recommendations we've made in our report should help to tighten up controls um, and to improve the delivery of these local um, schemes in future. In total, seven recommendations were made of which one was considered high priority. And the report is attached as appendix three to this pack. Okay. And apologies if I missed the point, but the concern must be surely that if the scheme isn't implemented, the risk is the person that's made the contribution can claim that in that case it's not being used and they will rec rec want to recover the, the contribution they made. So we were, why would it be risk there? Is that correct? I don't think that that was such a risk because there's a pot of money and then it's agreed how that's going to be allocated. Um, and this was agreed back in um, a policy committee, committee in 2018. It's just the slowness of implementing um, these schemes. Okay. So a couple of couple of people indicating, I think Paul, Paul Gittings was first, then Emmett. Yeah, thanks, uh, Chair, and apologies in advance if you hear some noises. <laughs> In, in the background, I mean, as, as, as members, you know, we, you know, we would obviously very keen on, the, you know, that we have this money, five times even planning gain to, to make improvements in, a, in our wards. And I think, you know, we sort of welcome, obviously, that we, as part of the process, which has been developed in fairness, because it's a new scheme that we get a, you know, get, we, we get a chance to do this in a structured way, but also meets the requirement of, you know, of, of seal. But I, I'm just wondering if, you know, if, if, if obviously the COVID situation now dating back to March, if that could be a reason also for the delay in the implementation of, of schemes, because clearly that must have been a factor um, in this. Yeah, we, we thought the COVID may have been a factor, but to be fair, um, this audit was requested probably just after COVID as um, lockdown one. So it was, um, it's been fairly recent. So I think the focus was on from November 18, yes, to the present day. Um, but I don't think COVID had a major impact on the delivery of these schemes. Emmett McKenna. Thank you. With my planning hat on, to reassure Councillor Davis, sorry, Councillor Stevens, yeah. that none of the money will be lost because there's a separate difference between Section 106, which is secured for a specific project for a specific purpose to make that one planning application acceptable, and the community infrastructure lever, levy, which was installed to provide a wider area benefit, which will provide, for example, school places, park improvements, and just to reflect what's happening in the local area. For um, this one, we had the 15% local, which was allocated to a lot of projects. I'll share the concern about the lack of delivery, which is entirely why the officers have taken this forward and asked for the audit to try and get some progress on something that was initially a very new program with a very new delivery that wasn't perhaps set up in the most efficient way when it was spread across a number of directorates and I'm quite happy with the suggestions going forward 
and they'll look forward to any reports coming through to policy to formalize the new procedures or elsewhere okay. because That's I'd helpful. expect to see yeah. progress and I may follow up in the audit tracker on priority one, which is to be due by the end of March. Or the second uh, one with the discrete roles and responsibilities for planning staff, etc. OK, good. Well, I think it's very helpful that you know, you've got this oversight because exactly. And, and of course, you see where my question was coming from. So I do remember back to the days of 106. And I think that was the worry that we couldn't ex properly explain how it was being apportioned and the risk exactly that. So you've got the point. Um, Richard Davis, unmute. It's um yeah I mean just to just briefly say like you know it, I'm glad this this is great that this is coming out. And there's also I think there's a paper coming to policy that I think I met, uh, Council McKenna alluded to, and um, because because you know people this is a link between councillors and their wards and their communities, um, and councillors often uh, you know people locally supported by councillors campaign for something to happen in their ward. And uh, you know when when they've success, managed to be successful in in, um, in in getting spend approval, that they then expect it to happen. Um, you know, it's, and, and it may be just a, a, a relatively small amount of money, up to fifteen percent of the sill. But it's actually you know issues like this that are sm small projects, little improvements that people want to see in their community. Um, that it it makes a disproportionate impact. I think. On um, on them seeing that their council's responsive to them, so yep. it's very important. And um, you know, I'm, I'm really welcome uh, the the recommendations. Look forward to them being um, being carried through. Okay. Thank you. Good. Okay. okay, Paul Harris, do you want to carry on with the next one? Yeah, sure. So um, the audit reviews of both licensing and car parks were um, given a positive assurance opinion. So I've got nothing to really highlight to the committee in those areas that they're all good. Um, page 22-23 is a table showing the audit plan for the year and where we're currently at. So um, it's positive. We're, we're, we're on course to complete the majority of the plan which is really good given the year we've had. Well, exactly. I, I was going to comment on this and you got there first. Just was how have you been impacted? Remarkably very little. We, I am, I'm, I'm really proud of, of the team. Mm. Not saying the mm. delivery of this plan, but we've got a separate plan for, for brighter futures and we're, we're pretty much on track to complete that or, or thereabouts. So I, I am really pleased um, and, and proud of the of mm. my officers mm. who contribute to this. Very but as you can see from the table, there's still too many ambers. That's the limited assurance reviews and these all feed into my overall annual assurance opinion which I will present to this committee in July of this year. The key areas we need to complete in order to inform my opinion are, are, are the financial systems. So it's accounts payable, accounts receivable, reconciliations, general ledger and they're all in progress. Now we've delayed, delayed, delayed because of the finance transformation but they're all in progress um, now. I'm hoping that I can report some 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 good progress in, in those areas. And then the remainder of the report, section three, it just summarises the work of the um, investigations team. OK, um, thank you. And I think that, that comment about the sort of the limited assurance is extremely important on, on, the, on the major systems. And perhaps could we ask, I think particularly Peter and possibly Jackie to pick this, pick this up. I think it will come in under item 11, which is the implementation of the financial improvement programme, because it's no it's no help. Obviously, if, if Paul Harrington and his team are regularly picking up on these items through their audits, hopefully they're coming through to the improvement plan. But if they don't, then obviously we get this awful sort of um, lack of assurance come the year end of the major systems. And then that obviously has an impact on external audit as well. Um, so I, th I think we we'll, must pick up that when we get to item 11. OK, so is that the end of the quarterly progress report? Yes, it is. Yes. Um, I can't see anybody else indicating. No. OK, well, I think the important thing for us to say is you know, well done for keeping on track. Cause, I mean, it must be so difficult to, to perform your role. I mean, we're all finding it hard working as we are, but for to do that sort of internal role is it's remarkable that you're achieving it. And obviously, say, come up with all these, still these recommendations, um, which is you know, vital for this committee, I think. So thank you for your work. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, so the next one up is the annual Treasury Management uh, Review 1920. And I've got down here Peter Robinson and Stuart Donnelly to introduce this. So um, I'm going to uh, introduce this paper, Chair. Actually, I've got two two papers that are very similar, uh, items five and, and item six. So the first one is the annual Treasury Management Review from 1920. This is a comparison. This is an outturn report based on what was approved at Council in February 2019. The second report is compared where we are at the moment, compared with the, the position in, in uh, February 20. They're quite similar reports. Um, uh, I won't go through in detail, but the reports sort of show how we've done um, in terms of overall spending compared with budget, how we've what we've done with borrowing, how we've done with our investments and in terms of our strategy to uh, what we call internally borrow to use our reserves and cash flow to, to rather than borrow externally and that makes quite significant savings in uh, in interest costs so if you've got any questions on this report and then i'll move on to the next one you might just explain that internally borrow so how we've got so, significant so, reserves. so what it means is that <clears throat> We um, it's sort of a, a phrase we we use. So in essence, it's treasury management is like having a what well, years ago we people had a one account. Yeah, you'd have one account and put everything together. So the council um, might spend money on capital, and it's got it's allowed to borrow to fund capital. It's not allowed yeah. to borrow to fund revenue. Yeah. But it holds cash reserves. So its balance sheet has got cash reserves on it. OK, and then also money will come through in the early part of the year and particularly this year. We've had lots of government grants come in that we distribute to to businesses and individuals that we hold on to. So rather than borrow yep. and spend on borrowing costs, we use that money we've got in the bank. OK, okay. Yeah, to keep borrowing a bit. So what we, it's the so term is yeah. internally oh, borrow. Right. Yeah, cash flow so so yeah, so, so it's cash flow, deferred, deferred expenditure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. OK, I see. Um, Emmett McKenna. Uh, so <clears throat> just so it's not lost, I'd like to draw people's attention to table six on page 79, which shows that we have deleveraged a lot of the short term borrowing that we were doing previously, yeah. which will help ensure the long term financial stability with the world in the current position, with coronavirus, with Brexit and so forth, which I'd like to welcome and thank officers for doing. While we've locked in historically extremely low rates. Yeah, yeah, the very low. Yeah. Thank you. OK, noted. Anybody else? No, so Peter, you want to go on to your second report? As, as I intimated at the start, very similar report, but this is just the, the mid-year position. Um, so it just says how we're doing. Of course, in terms of we haven't taken any borrowing out at all because our, our expenditure on capital has been curtailed quite significantly. Uh, and actually in terms of what we probably would do at the moment, temporary borrowing rates uh, are very cheap. So if there were fluctuations, we'd use temporary borrowing. So very similar report really. OK, um, again, I'm sort of scrolling through it just for a little go. I'm um, nobody else indicating. So I think we just note those reports, don't we? And thank you for them. <coughs> um, so that's items five and six. And then we go to item seven, which is the information governance quarterly update. Uh, Mike Graham to introduce this one. Yes, thank you, Chairman. This is the first such report to the Audit and Governance Committee and was requested at the last meeting. So the information um, provided this evening is to share details of the current initiatives in regards to information governance. So just might just briefly, everybody else, if you just with us, that's page 101 we're up to now. Sorry, carry on. Yep, so we're looking to share details of current initiatives and I'm also seeking to identify matters of interest for councillors for future reports. It's highlighted in the report, effective information governance is a key requirement for the council. 
Um, we've got duties to be both open and transparent, whilst at the same time protecting confidential information which you hold about people. And data is playing an increasing role in designing, delivering and transforming public services. In the past, we haven't had a, a overall strategy which draws all these issues together and allows us to think about designing services around user needs, engagement of empowerment of citizens, etc., efficiencies in relation to transformation, economic and social growth, transparency and accountability, etc. So it's a priority for us to put a, such a strategy in place. And we plan to come back at regular intervals to update members on the strategy and progress under it. So a key issue is for members to indicate what issues that they would like us to report on the next time. Members will note that we will be bringing a report back on the strategy of the next meeting, and also a separate report on FOI progress towards um, uh, progress for the year uh, and reporting that at the next annual governance meeting, because we know that that performance is an important issue for the council. Okay. Members will also know there are various information governance issues which have been raised by previous audits, including one which is on your agenda tonight relating to records management. So we want to update on progress towards the fulfillment of those recommendations. And just one apology, Chairman, in that uh, 4.10, for some reason, um, the version of the report, which is sneaked X through percentage. the agenda. As you've, gone into, you've gone into missing, Roman numerals there, Mr. Graham. Yeah, it's got the missing percentages in. So it's, um, it is 6% of councillors, sorry, six councillors, not 6%, six councillors have completed their cybersecurity training and 606 officers have completed their training and that has been discussed in a recent information Go governance board meeting and we're looking at ways to improve those figures and get greater uptake. Well that's quite a useful point so the, presumably what you're hoping that we're everybody all councillors and all officers do this? Yes. It's, it's mandatory? It is and we're looking at ways uh, in which we can record that um, performance okay. for officers certainly in uh, in appraisals. That's something for us to pick up then, because I have to. I wouldn't. I didn't get that as mandatory, so we must make sure we do that. Then, I guess my instant comment was exactly that, as you mentioned, referring back to internal audit reports. It would be useful to collate the internal audit reports around this area, so that we're reporting on it in terms of what activity is happening, but also then obviously monitoring the effectiveness of it through internal audit reports, so we can somehow cluster them together, so we can sort of see. Yes, well, this is what we think we're doing, and it's supported by internal audit, as we heard earlier. I think that would be helpful. Yeah. Um, I appreciate you know, the structure, the, 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 the um, agenda takes them apart, but it'd be useful to say, okay, well, this is what we've done, and the internal reports endorse what they're telling us. Various people, a number of people are actually um, indicating. Let's go with Josh Williams first. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much for this report. It seems like a really welcome addition to the Council, this um, information board. Could I just ask a couple of quick questions? Uh, there's, there's quite a lot of detail in the report we have about what the board will be doing, but does it have a kind of um, a set down remit? Does it have a terms of reference or a sort of single page um, version of why it exists that, yeah. that could be shared? And, so. and one of the things I'm interested in is the published data on the um, over £500 spend that the council publishes on the website. Yeah. And I wondered, would that be part uh, of the remit and will that be looked at in the near future? Yes, that's part and parcel of the, if you look at the order recommendations on data transparency, again, another unfortunately limited assurance one. And we have already got actions kicked off um, with the um, data intelligence team and they are looking at how we can bring information through automatically from systems to make it sure it's published on on the council's website so that's already in hand but again we can report back on that um, the next at the next meeting um, Perfect, thank you and uh, sorry what, was there a sort of single page uh, uh, terms of reference or similar yes I will bring it back for you yes and oh. sorry <laughs> sorry thank you very much um, Richard Davis well, just to say that um, this seems like a really good response to, uh, you know, not, is it kind of modern uh, thing, isn't it? Information governance, you know, in the last few years, it's been it's been something that people are more and more uh, are getting concerned with. And it's kind of a whereas we might have a few years ago, we might have talked about data protection and this kind of thing. It's like more of an overarching, uh, uh, overarching discipline, I guess. Um, 
uh, information governance there. It's great to see the council responding to that because um, as we've discussed here in, in the past, you know, the public wants us to be open. Uh, they want to, us not only to be open and, and, you know, the name of the game, this this committee is all, all, all about openness and uh, being happy to uh, scrutinise our own innards, if you like, our own workings and, and expose expose those to scrutiny. Um, and um, they won't be able to get FOIs if, if they if they submit them, they want them to be dealt with in a timely manner. But on the, you know, in a, in a kind of instinctively sort of conflicting way, they also want their data about themselves to be very much protected, <laughs> where the council knows stuff about you. Um, it, that it has to know for it to conduct to conduct your business. It wants to wants to be sure that that's um, that that's uh, safe, only accessible by the person that, that 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 needs to access it. That it's deleted when it doesn't need to be held anymore. That it's appropriately managed, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and archived and all the rest of it. And so you know the, the the discipline has got more complex because the 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 um, electronic records are obviously uh, much more dominant dominant these days. And but you know what people. Uh, expect and what they demand about their data is uh, is very high profile and and um, and right, rightly so. So you know we we seem to be you know keeping up with that that demand and this is a this is a very welcome um, welcome activity and I, and I think that we should you know this 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 committee is should be central in uh, and I think you've touched on this is this committee should be central as recipients of the work done by this. This committee going forward, and you know, bringing things to us um, as we continue to do, as you've done in the past, I think is um, is is very welcome. And uh, yeah, so I was pleased to see this report, really. So thank you. Good, Emerson. Thank you, Chair. No, I just wanted to support you in the steer to the monitoring officer that I think it makes sense to report back on issues that have been flagged already by the internal audit. And, you know, record management has come up tonight and it would be good to have a focus on that. And then just on the training, it's interesting, Chair, that you didn't realise it was mandatory. So I'll mm. liaise with um, relevant officers to make sure that councillors know that because the uptake at the moment is pathetic. And I'd like to take the opportunity to be smug and say I've done it and it didn't take long. Um, and it was quite good. It was a lot better than the usual training modules you do. It was very bespoke to councillors in terms of how you pick up casework and stuff like that and it's really important that we um, practice what it says within and use those steps so I make sure that uh, councillors are made aware that it's mandatory and actually that it didn't take long and it was really helpful and I think given previous breaches in terms of security at other councils where they've really suffered Cleveland and Hackney just to name a couple of them it's really important that we get on it because it you know it really affects councils in terms of what they can offer customers where they've literally had to go completely offline because of breaches and i think at the moment it's really important to push this agenda and that means the whole yeah. organization doing the training i think the other thing yeah. i made to add to what councillor emerson has said is that um, for for i think for councillors and officers um, it's really valuable information in that training for your own personal lives in terms of protecting you and your own your own security and your own use of technology. And if we can give a training uh, the plug, it's good fun actually because there are lots of little um, really short accessible little cartoons and quizzes which um, um, which are really 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 good um, form of online training. I, I have to say um, that when I when I first saw them, I was I was really excited to get behind them. Because they were okay. so good quality, I th and I think that's key. I mean, I, I, some mitigation. I think we are fairly well bombarded with all this stuff through work. At least I am, and see that I've, got, I've seen all this that I hadn't pinged. But actually, as you say, it's obvious that in our role as councillors, it might be different. We should do it. And the other is, we ought to be exemplars, and that we ought to be saying that we do all this. So it's perfectly reasonable that all the officers and staff then do it. If we're not doing it, we're not leading from the front. So I think what will be helpful if um, we send a note around. I know who to do this, Michael, but send a note around saying. Here it is, guys. It is mandatory. It's not sort of choice. Even if you're doing it in your daily working lives, this is in your capacity as council. And here's a simple link to it. I think that's part of it as well, the, the navigability of it. Just here it is. Now do it. It will take you how long? 10 minutes, 15 minutes. But I expect, and we can then chase it around um, and make sure that we all do it. Give us give us a del's a deadline. Thank you. Think, yes, support we will happily support that. Yeah, I mean, so ignorance rather than sort of mendacious sort of <laughs> avoiding it. Um, but it's yes, absolutely, we should do it. Ellie, again, you want to say something else? 
No, Chair, just agreeing. You're just, just holding your hand up, that's all. Oh, no. your, your little yellow hands, that's it, got it, okay. Right, um, and the other, the other thoughts I have on this one, Michael Graham, is some sort of structure so we know who's responsible for which elements of this. It's a big subject, and I guess various people are involved and have different roles in it, and it would help my mind just understanding how it all fits together and who, who's responsible for which bits of it. Okay. That would help, but I think help sort of clarify it. But I think uh, fundamentally... I'll, I'll look at that, yes, of course, yeah. And the other th again, it might be in there, apologies if I miss it, is document, we're quite keen on the firm of um, not obviously document retention, yes, but also destruction. Because what yes. you don't want to do is necessarily hold on to stuff for longer than you're obliged to keep it. Because obviously that becomes discoverable, as, you, as we well know. If you've got it, then, uh, then it can be, <laughs> be required to be provided. Whereas if, we, if you have a policy that says it's destroyed after typically eight years, and you follow that, then you can't be expected to produce something that's nine years old, which, is, which actually is quite helpful. Yes. Okay, well, I think we've explored that one. Um, everybody happy? Jolly good. So that was number seven. Now, at this point, um, we've got to item eight, and it's gone seven o'clock. So has Maria joined us? I she has. Been, there she I? is. Super. <clears throat> perfectly yep. timed. So <laughs> if we want to go to your... Um, Report. There we go. It's the um. Oh, it's it's in it's in uh, landscapes. So doesn't fit on my screen. Hold on. So it's the basically it's the the draft audit planning report. So Maria, it's all yours. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you for um for um putting up with my awful calendar this evening. Nope. Um, I actually managed to join at, at quarter two, so it's been really good to hear the discussion so far. Um, just to say, um, I'm going to introduce a report, and I'll ask um Adrian to take you through the executive summary. But what I really wanted to do was talk about where we are currently with the audit, because. Whilst we're bringing the audit plan to this committee, that's just a timing thing. We have to bring a plan for the audit, but members will know that we started the audit work um, some months ago and um, the audit is progressing. It's um, We've very much um, cleared a lot of the, um, the detailed work. We've still got quite a bit of detailed work to go, um, but very pleased with the way the audit is progressing to date. Um, and uh, I just wanted to to kind of give that context because obviously bringing the plan to this committee members might be thinking, oh my goodness, I thought this audit um, started a little, you know, quite a while ago. And actually, um, uh, it's purely that we do have to bring a plan to you um, just to set out the, the work that we we are undertaking and that we plan to do. So that that was just the explanation of the timing and also an update on how the audit's going. Um, the, the other point I just wanted to make is we are continuing to work really closely with your teams. Um, we have regular updates um, every couple of weeks, including myself and um, Jackie Yates, and then more regular updates through the weeks um, with the teams um, on the detail. And that is um, uh, really um, paying dividends from the point of view of keeping on top of the trackers and and what we're we're doing with regards to progressing the audit, so I just wanted to give that opening kind of assurance to members as to how the audit was going. Um, but now I'll just ask Adrian, please, to just talk through the executive summary points in the audit plan. Yeah, thanks, Maria. So if I could just ask the committee to start on page one one one, which is the first page of the significant risks, and I can just talk the committee through some of the the key messages. Um, yep. Uh, so on pages 111 and 112, we've highlighted the significant risks or inherent risks that we have identified for the 1819 audit. We've color coded these so you can be clear about areas where we actually changed our risk or focus. So you can see uh, throughout pages 112 and 111 and 112 that actually there are some changes. Some of the risks you'll recognize from previous years. So we'll just talk through some of those at a high level. Uh, we've got the risk of fraud and revenue and expenditure recognized recognition this is around the incorrect capitalization of revenue expenditure um, that's been a consistent theme for the last few years and uh, we're happy to report that in the previous years we haven't identified any such instances uh, but we've identified as a further risk uh, for this year as well in terms of the next area which is highlighted red so there's a partial change of risk and focus in this area so this is around the qualified accounts from the 1718 uh, audited financial statements so we identified a number of areas there where we actually had areas of qualification 
um, and will do significant work around those areas to try and reduce the qualifications moving into 18, 19. So specifically, they were around areas around uh, some aspects of income and expenditure and aspects around the, the pension scheme. In terms of the pension scheme, I think the committee will probably remember actually that one of the issues we had in the prior year was around the lack of uh, availability of uh, yes. cooperation from the previous auditor. I'm happy to report that we've actually been in contact with the, the new auditor for the Berkshire Pension Fund. And just this week, actually, we've received the assurances for the 1819 audit. Um, so there won't be any similar issues this year. We're just working through that layer and some of the implications of that. And we've also will be receiving in the next month or so some of the 1920 assurances as well. So actually, in terms of the next couple of years, we're kind of moving on through that quite nicely and the level of cooperation and that's been good. Um, in terms of other areas, just moving on to page 112. Uh, on the other page, so we've got some inherent risks around uh, valuations of property, plant, and equipment, and the PFI. Essentially, within those balances are areas where uh, some of the biggest uh, balances on the balance sheet come through. Uh, there's highly uh, subjective assumptions, and actually, we do quite a lot of work in those just to make sure that everything is materially correct. Um, we're happy to report that we haven't identified significant material issues in previous years, and we'd hope that that would be the case this year. Mm. In terms of IFRS 9 and IFRS 15, we've identified as a new area of audit focus. Um, so this was new um, as part of the 1819 uh, for code. So the IFRS financial statements uh, and financial policies changed in respect to financial instruments, which is the IFRS 9 element and IFRS 15 uh, revenue from contracts. Uh, our previous experience across local government is the IFRS 15 revenue from contracts and some of the specifics of that isn't overly relevant for some uh, clients. So we'll have to do some work on that and understand that. IFRS 9 is more of an impact um, around the financial instruments and how those are classified. So in a future report and a future committee, we'll be able to update you on where we've got to with that. So I just, areas, just pause them. So just yeah. to, um, I think I'm right understand this. So we're saying these are generally areas that have come up generally generic problems they're not specific necessarily to rbc simply that they are concerns but but you're not saying they're enhanced concerns here just simply that they are new and you need to sort of uh, you're both shaking or nodding so it looks like I'm, okay that's good yeah that's correct so effectively these are new uh, changes to the counting standards for these two particular areas um so this would have been implemented across all of local government with the effect from the 18 19 accounts uh, and because they're new we just need to do the work just to understand that and then hopefully as i said we move through ifrs 15 and don't identify any issues then moving forward Forward, that wouldn't be an issue. Um, IFRS 9 we'll look at in more detail because it is more intricate and it is dependent on the nature of the investments and borrowings held by, by the council. Um, the other area I probably just wanted to touch on really was around uh, the group accounts. Uh, we've identified that as, an, as a new area of focus and I think it's probably just uh, to bring to the committee's attention just the, the increased significance of the group structure. Um, so a number of different subsidiaries have now uh, been incorporated within the group accounts. Uh, for example, coming into 1819 will be the first year where Brighter Futures for Children, for example, has been incorporated. Uh, we've got a growing scope within homes for Reading, uh, Reading Transport Limited, which is previously in scope. So all of these different aspects need to kind of do individual individual pieces of work and takes quite a lot of liaison with the respective auditors for each of those, uh, mainly the external auditors, just to understand the work that's been done. So again, looking at that, that'll be a key area of focus for us. And then lastly, I, just, again, just pause on that one. Can I just ask, yeah. is it more complicated because you're having to liaise with other specialist auditors? Because conventionally, what I see in our world is obviously, typically, you would do a group audit and you would, yeah. as one firm, do everything. Here, you're having to liaise with two, three different other audit firms. Yeah, Does that's that correct. It, is that, and, and you're obviously placing, presumably, placing reliance on what they pass through to you. Well, so yeah, that, the numbers, obviously, they're audits. Your place yeah, so that, that, that's, that's correct. So we, we would liaise. There is a kind of um, a rule between audit firms that actually they would do a program of work. So we've already been in contact with all of the auditors involved. Uh, similarly with BDO, who were the auditors for Reading Transport Limited. We've been in correspondence with them for the last two years. But moving in for Homes for Reading and Brighter Futures for Children, that'll be a new arrangement moving into for the 18-19 financial statements. And obviously, it just adds additional... Uh, work complexity and just some of the additional procedures that we need to do to kind of satisfy audit procedures. I think the other key thing would be that the subsidiary accounts are prepared under a different uh, code than the SIPFA code. Mm -hmm. And actually consolidation can bring challenges around uh, interpretation of how that's done. So uh, we're working through at the moment with the finance team in a number of areas. And actually, I think we have made good progress and across a number of areas of group and we'll be able to report back um, at the April committee in terms of the, the work we've done in any particular findings of that. Mm. 
And then probably the last area I just want to touch on at the bottom of the page was around the going concern disclosure. So you can appreciate that moving through uh, the last financial year with COVID, uh, we had lots of concerns, not necessarily with the, the council itself, but just around the, the wider public sector and some of the subsidiaries. Um, and actually we need to do extensive procedures around going concern um, to kind of satisfy ourselves that the going concern assumption was still still applicable and still relevant. Um, so we did extensive work on that last year, looking at forward cash flows uh, for a period beyond the financial statements uh, to make sure that there was sufficient cash and the projections and the assumption underpinning that were uh, suitable as well. So again, with having coming up to almost the first full year of COVID, we'll be doing similar procedures this year and we'll also be taking note of uh, the subs subsidiaries as well and also the council's position in terms of the oversight role they have within that. Um, Sorry, can I just ask again, there's lots of questions, but the going concern point, is that as of today or is that as of the close of the, the accounts in March 2019? Yeah, so we have to consider up to the date of uh, the actual opinion being signed. So um, currently we're aiming towards later in the spring to do that. So we would have to take into consideration um, the, all information that we have available at that time. Um, and the forward cash flow that we'd be looking for would be from the date of the uh, the sign off the accounts effectively. So anytime over the next few months, we'll be looking for that forward projection, similar to what we did when we signed off the 17, right. 18 accounts in the autumn. So um, quite a big piece of work and it's something that's becoming a uh, greater focus across all of all of the local government and yeah. certainly all of the clients. Um, um, are doing much more extensive work in this and also the, the disclosures involved as well within the financial statements are much more substantive than what you've probably seen in the past. Okay. And that's probably all I wanted to say. Happy to take any questions on any other content of the report. So I'm looking, so Josh Williams. Uh, Josh is on mute. Mute. I'm still on can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, the, actually, I was going to ask the very same question you did on the going concern because I wasn't quite clear why it was in the 1819 plan, but I am now. Thank you very much for that. Mm. Can I just briefly look at the note that you've got next to IFRS 9 and 15, which says that when you started looking at this, the local authority had not conducted any preliminary work on either of those standards. Is this uh, is this a space in which we as a local authority are behind and we should have done that preliminary work or is it just that um, that, that those standards only came in in 1819 anyway and therefore this is the time to do that preliminary work now whilst you're auditing because um, I, I couldn't quite make out from the statement whether there was a, an element lacking there or simply it's a timeline thing. Uh, so, so this is the first year that the financial statements need to be prepared under that particular standard. I think um, probably the awareness of IFRS 9 and IFRS 15, certainly IFRS 15 in terms of the revenue from contracts hasn't been considered to be overly significant. I think the IFRS 9, uh, the financial instruments aspect is something that we will work through with the council in terms of uh, what the disclosures and the kind of the implications of that. It's certainly done on a very individual basis by the nature of the financial instruments you hold. Uh, but certainly, I think it was just given the time is moving out of the 18, or the 17, 18 accounts into the 18, 19 accounts, because uh, effectively we started the audit almost one week after we'd finished the previous one. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the planning arrangements, which we'd normally would do, that wasn't really there because actually your accounts had been prepared and we were able to move into that. Uh, but certainly for other clients, when we did the 18, 19 accounts at the kind of timing, uh, we did have planning memos, but I think it's just purely circumstance of the timing when we finished 17, 18, and also the the, the desire to start the 18, 19 audit uh, kind of su su uh, subsequent to that. Thank you very much. That makes uh, sense. Uh, just to rehearse a point, which I just, for my benefit, but obviously everybody else chip in if they wish. So we could have a situation where we have an unqualified report for year ended 18, 19, but obviously the historically there's quite a long gap between there and now. The going concern report uh, statement is obviously as of you say spring of this year which also presumably has to include things like the subsidiary companies as to what state they're in so I could well see we potentially have an unqualified audit report for the year ended 19 but concerns obviously about going concern up to current date which would be obviously extended interval between is that is that right? Yeah so I think what one of the things that was um we did last year we we, we spoke to Jackie and Peter about this and we also spoke to the external auditors from RTL and some of the other subsidiaries and we, we, we got some representations from 
uh, some of the subsidiaries as well as to the kind of cash flow and kind of projections. So that is much more of an area of focus for us and I and actually in terms of the risk profile, not necessarily just because of Reddingborough Council and the group, but across the wider public sector. Um, a lot of councils have wider group structures and subsidiaries. And obviously mm. the change in circumstances and a number of those has actually brought additional risk. Um, so that is an increased area of focus. It could mean actually that we modify the audit opinion and we actually have a, a specific focus there on going concerns. So you could have a qualified audit opinion, but we'd actually have a paragraph within the audit opinion, which would draw the reader's attention to the fact that uh, we did flag or we could flag potential concerns about going concern. Yes. Because it strikes me that it was even because we appreciate we're in arrears with these audits. In a sense, it's historic. What you tell us about year ended 19 is, is gone, finished, happened. But yeah. actually, it, it, it wouldn't be terribly helpful to mix that with the sort of current going concern. Uh, um, so we, in a sense, we want to get sort of those out of the way and obviously 1920 ditto. Yeah. And then, then, then the going concern becomes a real live issue as we move into 20 and 21. Yeah, and I think mm. the other consideration for earlier accounts is obviously the post balance sheet events, because actually when you think about it, the, the accounts that we're signing off are actually the accounts as at the 31st of March 2019. Mm. But obviously your post balance sheet events account, yeah. the post consideration is up to the points the accounts are approved or authorised for issue. So a lot's happened between yeah. the 31st of March 19, and obviously that's what we considered last year within the 17, 18 accounts. Yes. We had some extensive disclosures around post balance sheet events to kind of re reflect the fact that COVID had obviously had a significant impact on the financial and operational planning mm. of the council. Mm. Yes, yeah, so, so in my mind, the two are fairly distinct and say what, what is historic based on what was happening almost two years ago now, and then yeah. what's happening currently, and we need to sort of be clear. So yeah, okay, got that. Um, nobody else is indicating, is that right? Anybody else wants to contribute? No, okay, so I think at that point we say thank you very much to both of you. Are you sticking around for, is it the very next item about talking about the Redmond Review, which I think would be quite interesting to have your input on that if you're both staying, if you're not, so be it, but if you are, it'd be interesting to hear your views. I may have to go, but I think Fair enough. Adrian, yeah. you might be able to stay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm happy to stay. I'll try to stay yeah. on as long as I can, but I'm going to No, understood, you obviously you're meeting. doing the tour, very good. Okay, well thank you both for that, very appreciated. Um, and I say, I think it is this item, isn't it now? The next one, it's a um, Redmond Review. Um, and Paul Harrington, I think you're going to introduce it. Um, I think we actually, as though this was our request, I think a number of us, I think I listened to Sir Philip sort of give his review or a pretty, um, summary of it. And I think a number of us were quite interested to hear about it and the impact it would have. So if, if you could introduce that for us, we'd be grateful. Yeah, so yes, you're right. At the last um, committee meeting, we agreed that we were would report back to this committee meeting on the on the findings of the um Sir Tony Redmond's review. But totally. since since then the, the government have um issued their response to the um recommendations on the 17th of December. So the report covers um Sir Tony Redmond's findings, his recommendations. There were 23 recommendations flowing from the Redmond review. If Sorry, just, for, Paul, just briefly, just for everybody's benefit, just briefly set the scene about what the review was about, what they're looking at. Yep, so the report, um, so Sir Tony Redmond's review was into the effectiveness of external audit and transparency of um, financial reporting in local authorities. Um, and it also examined the effectiveness of local audit and its ability to demonstrate accountability for audit performance to the public. Um, and whether it also looked at the, the local annual accounts and whether these enable the public to understand um, the finance, financial information of, of the authority um, and that so they can get assurances that finances are, are sound. Um, so if you go to page 162 of my report, which is Appendix A, I've listed the recommendations um, in a sort of table format along with the government's response, just, just for your ease in terms of um, uh, reading. Um, it should be noticed that, noted that the council is not considered a smaller authority for audit and accounts purposes. So four recommendations haven't been included. So recommendations 14, 15, 16 and 23. So the Redmond Review um, falls into three main topics, which are local audit arrangements, governance arrangements and financial reporting. So just to give you some of the, the headlines, um, the report concluded that the local audit market is very fragile um, and that the current free fee structure 
does not enable auditors to fulfill their role in an entirely satisfactory way. Um, it said that 40% of audits failed to meet the required deadline for report in 1819. Um, there were some observations of external auditors potentially lacking skills and experience um, as local government is an extremely complex um, environment. Um, there were capacity um, concerns um, of external audit um, firms. Um, the report recommended that there be an increase in audit fees um, and that the 30th of September deadline for audit completion be reinstated rather than the 31st of July. So these recommendations have been agreed by the government. Um, additional 15 million will be allocated to local authorities, but we don't know the detail yet as in terms of uh, what Reading will receive. Um, and the Sorry, so is that for, literally for, for spend on audits? Yes, yes, that's across the board. That's not just, um, yeah, but we don't know what our allocation is as of today. Um, one of the underlying features of the existing framework is the absence of a body to coordinate all stages of the audit process. Um, and Sir Tony Redmond um, constantly made recommendations for a um, for, for a new regulatory body, but this was um, not dismissed by the government, but they haven't been persuaded that a new arms length body is required and they're going to explore um, new options um, and they will come forward in the spring of this year. In terms of governance, um, it was recommended and agreed that the annual report be submitted to full council, well, this is the external auditor's annual report, be submitted to full council by the external auditor. Um, consideration be given to the appointment of at least one independent member suitably qualified to the audit committee. Um, uh, recommendations are made about formalising the uh, facility for the chief exec, monitoring officer and financial officer to meet with key audit partners at least annually. Um, again, those recommendations were agreed. In terms of financial reporting, um, the report concluded that the current statutory accounts prepared by local authorities are impenetrable to the public, and it recommended a simplified statement of service information and costs is prepared by each local authority. Um, this will be a standard statement, I understand, one to three pages long. Um, and sit for our work, our working to, to produce this, but I think the aim is to is to produce this from the 2021-22 uh, financial year. So that's that was yeah. a very very quick overview of the report. As I say, the um, the recommendations and the government response are in Appendix A to this report. Okay. Um, thank you for that. And I don't know. Can I just start? I noticed a couple of people indicating, but just to start off. I mean, the one that I'm most aware of is, is the business, you said, the fragility of the local audit markets. And what worries me is that obviously the demand to perform the audits and then it's getting particularly sort of um, audit firms to, to bid for these audits um, at relatively no margins from their perspective. And I think there's a risk that if, if the if fees are driven down, then um, fewer firms will actually be wanting to do this work. And we can see the whole market then collapse and there's simply there won't be enough audit resource around out there doing it. And I don't know if um, Adrian or if she's still here, Maria wants to sort of comment on the actual, the, the current the market and how, how we go about public sector auditing. Yes, I think, you know, from EY's perspective, we fed into, you know, we had meetings with Tony Redmond in terms of a senior level to kind of give our viewpoint in terms of the market. Um, I think it's fair to say that, you know, the fee structure of the last few years has been uh, significantly depleted in terms of what it was previously um, and I think part of the the oversight role of the PSAA is the kind of over, oversight body for the, the current audit market part of that contract with local audit firms that when it was signed five years ago was actually that it was done on a, a sort of a, a tender basis and actually a lot of the the market has changed since then in terms of mm -hmm. the regulation and the expectations of audit firms um, certainly the regulators are asking us to do more than what we did five years ago and the expectation from the public and the wider uh, the wider stakeholder group is actually that again audit firms should be doing more and actually the fee structure as it currently stands probably yeah. isn't suitable for that particular uh, to do everything they need to do at the kind of the quality of uh, work they need to do and um, so certainly for us you know one of the things we did talk about in terms of being um, appropriately remunerated for the work and actually being able then to recruit, recruit and retain 
uh, staff and make that a kind of appropriate and kind of acceptable, attractive way to kind of get graduates to come back into the marketplace. Because by training and bringing graduates through is how we then uh, sort of keep that quality of audit coming through over the next few years. Yeah. But certainly, I think I, I'm that, sorry, I'm right in saying, well, again, correct me if I'm wrong. It is not, it's not as simply as graduates come in, they do a dip into a bit of public sector SIPPA type auditing, then they dip back out and go into company house, or oh, sorry, um, company uh, act, you know, public, pub, private, and public companies. You can't do that, can you? You can't jump around or can you? Uh, you, you tend to sort of commit to one or the other. Yeah, so some some of our staff actually they, they do um, either ICAW or they do ICAS or they do ACA. So actually a number of them go through the corporate route, but then they do specific modules for the public sector. So a number of our staff have options to move into the corporate world after that. But I think um, you can probably see in terms of the, the kind of lack of firms or big four firms who are involved in the current marketplace that actually, as you just said, you know, the attractiveness to the market is kind of not what it used to be. So I think the, the kind of recommendation on fees would hopefully bring that back in again and actually increase that competition. And I think that would be good for the sector. I think one of the things that we found with the demise of the Audit Commission was that um, there was so much diversity and so many different forms of reporting into different bodies that a lot of the cohesiveness that you got from the Audit Commission and actually the recommendations coming out from that central body were lost. So I think that's probably where the recommendation came from Sir Tony Redmond to kind of come back, take that back again to have a, a central yeah. organised body to do that. I think uh, the, the government have come back and said that actually that's not what they'd like to do. It's not within their recommendations. They don't think that's some, something they want to take forward. Um, I think some of the practical things they have suggested are beneficial. So moving the audit deadline back to the end of September again, um, I think that gives audit firms and clients, you know, the benefit of actually working through complex areas because the end of July deadline, which was the new statutory deadline um, to do the accounts in two months, didn't really help anyone. And there wasn't any kind of uh, reason why it was done from a parliamentary point of view either. Um, so actually, that's something that the audit firms were, were kind of pushing for. And actually, that's a recommendation we accept. So I think, you know, there's lots of things in there. You know, Paul's talked about the 15 million that's been put forward to uh, be distributed amongst clients. And that's kind of from an audit fees perspective and also to help clients with the financial statement close down process, which is cumbersome and actually takes a long time. And I think one of the things they have talked about is trying to make the accounts more user friendly, because I think it's probably fair to say that for the average man in the street to look at the accounts, actually, you know, it's quite complex. And actually, it doesn't tell sometimes a lot of the kind of key messages which the councillors yeah. report during the year. So I think a number of recommendations we welcome. And I think, you know, there's we, we haven't kind of an agreed position yet, but certainly we'll work through anything that we can do in terms of mm -hmm. trying to make it a smoother process and something that's more beneficial to clients and kind of wider stakeholders as well. Yeah. Okay, so so pause there. So a number of people are indicating Jason and Jason Brock. I think you're the first to say you want to say and um, contribute. Thank you, Chair. I, I just want to say, I mean, I was uh, expecting greater things of the Redmond review than what kind of transpired in practice. But I've made my way through the report and six of the eight annexes, and I think one of the reasons I was particularly disappointed is the entire report assumes that a council has executive arrangements. I mean, it even says uh, within the report itself, by, uh, paragraph 5.2.3, as in the actual report, not the report before us in the papers tonight. Um, overview and scrutiny committees are required by statute. Well, that's not true if you're a committee based system uh, and it makes no it pays no attention to this. Now, I accept that the vast majority of councils have executive arrangements, but clearly they don't. Uh, not every council does because we don't. In fact, we're not required to have an audit committee at all. Entirely right that we do. Um, and I think it, it, in a great many respects, we're very good at how we've set up the audit committee. And I do welcome actually the fact that, um, uh, that the, the Green Party have taken up their place on the audit and governance committee over the past two years. I think it's important and valuable that uh, as many groups as possible are represented. Um, I think what, one of the things that, that I, I, well, I suppose to kind of go back to the point you were making, Chair, I think that there's a problem on both the demand side and the supply side in terms of the public sector audit industry um, and a lot of challenges. And I think the review hasn't necessarily enabled um, uh, a policy framework to be developed that will get to grips with all of those. I think the most promising aspect of it to me is the proposal to introduce an office of local audit regulation, uh, kind of bringing back in amended form something that we used to have. 
Uh, the government haven't fully responded to that yet, if I recall correctly. I think that's in uh, Mr. Harrington's report that they expect to respond by, by the spring of this year. And I, I really sincerely hope that the government do take up that idea because I think it'd be a very valuable thing for councils up and down the country. I suppose one of the interesting dynamics for us to consider in Reading, and then probably not a discussion to have a great length tonight, but something for members of the committee and elsewhere to muse on, is this question around having a co-opted independent member mm. of the committee. Uh, the challenge, of course, being to find a suitably qualified person and finding incentives that would mean that they would come along and do their job properly. Uh, my gut kind of says that that's more appropriate if we were to restructure the committee as a purely audit committee, because some of the, the governance arrangements, I would think, are properly sat with elected members, because elected members are elected to deal with that kind of thing. So it would require, in my view, perhaps a little bit of constitutional rejigging, and maybe that governance element should move to the standards committee, which would be beefed up and so on. But nonetheless... I do think that there, there are there are arguments both uh, for and against that kind of approach. Um, but it is a shame that the review didn't consider um, maybe some specific um, uh, kind of um, analysis of uh, councils that don't have executive arrangement systems, because inevitably there will be a difference. Um, some of the some elements, for example. Um, taking the audit report to full council, entirely fine. And in fact, the report predicates that on the basis that full council gets more public attention than committees. I don't think that's true in Reading. Actually, I think our committee meetings get more scrutiny and more column inches in the press than full council does. So, uh, but nonetheless, you know, it doesn't concern me. It's a perfectly reasonable thing to propose. Um, but you see, I suppose, my point that, that unfortunately it doesn't apply as neatly to us in Reading as it mm. might do to, let's say, uh, some other councils. Anyway, I've gone on for too long. I'll have a few chat. No, thank you for that. Um, who else is one? Ellie Emerson, you had obviously views about this. It'd be interesting to hear if you're, if you're happy to do some, some couple of points from you. Yeah, I suppose I don't have much to add. I think I support what's already been said. And I think Reading is unique with our kind of hybrid system. Obviously, it's a committee system, but we do have lead members, you know. And indeed, I think we've spoken before about the fact that all these reports are in my name, but I sit on the committee and, you know, the purpose of the committee in terms of how we look at where set up. So I think it's an interesting kind of discussion that we should have and see what the government do in terms of how they implement it alongside SIPFA and whether you know it becomes kind of you know you're told to have an independent member or whether that's something we might want to look at um sooner and indeed we have a weird um thing whereby you are the chair you know not many councils have the opposition in the chair and I think it's right that we do and it you know enhances a very wise decision I have to say yeah <laughs> no so I think you know there's a wider conversation to be had you know, on the committee, I suppose it's, you know, offline or at a later date about in terms of when the government respond and how we do things. So I agree with all that. I mean, I think I think one of the tests I had to my mind was in the, in the Reading context, which what is it about the way we do business currently that isn't working? What, what's ineffective? And I tended to come back with the answer. Actually, the way we do things at the moment is, is pretty sound, I think. Um, I, I don't feel that there's any inhibition. We're not prevented from making inquiries, um, asking for reports and so on. I think we inquire, we, we challenge and so on. So to my mind, there weren't, weren't any sort of obvious holes in what we're doing. I do have real worries because I'm sort of more familiar with it about the provision of the service from the audit firms. I, I just, unless it's attractive to them and unless it's attractive to their people, we won't um, have that, that that's the supply of people coming and doing our audits, which worries me. I, I didn't, and I think Redmond picked up on this fragmentation, the fact that as Adrian already mentioned, the subsidiary companies, we, they audit in one particular way, but then they're fed through uh, some sort of public, um, sorry, um, pro private company type audits um, and reporting that's fed through into public sector, but then local authorities are different to the health service. They have a completely different way of reporting and auditing, and it seems to be very fragmented, which is extremely unhelpful. The other thing I'd say about an independent person, I think that's a, that's a big ask because the, the problem comes is you want somebody who's competent enough to really understand what's going on, that is prepared to commit not just for a year or two, but as we all find, it takes years really to really to understand this stuff and get into it. So you'd have to commit for quite a period. 
Um, who are they responsible to? Presumably to nobody because they're not elected. And we don't want them to become some some expert to whom we all defer and they become second guesser or you know, sort of a second line of inquiry to the auditor. So it's sort of what, what is their contribution? What are we asking of them? Um, and who is that person? Because not that many people want to sit through two or three hours as we're doing and listening to this stuff um, on, on their sort of on their Wednesday or Thursday nights. So I think <laughs> it's a big <laughs> ask of somebody. Um, so I, I think there's some concerns, but so I come back to the point. I think we're not wide of the mark in terms of what we're doing at the moment, but that's that's my impression. Um, Josh Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was going to almost literally say what you just said, but I didn't take my hand down in time. My question, I, mean, I don't want to drag this out too long, but as we're on the subject, I was going to ask what an independent member brings. Is it expertise that we as councillors may not have in the, in the world of finance, for example, or is it challenge to, um, to challenge without any concerns about, I, I don't know, um, a group leader telling you off or a, a voter changing their mind? Because if it's just independent challenge, then as Councillor Brock's already said, we're, we're here. I'm here. You're here. Um, I'm not concerned uh, what the administration thinks of what I say, and um, they're not always too concerned about what I say, and, and, and on we go. Yeah. Or, it, But if it's expertise, then maybe it would be simpler to train us um, in a more in-depth way on, on audit and on finance. Um, so I'm not clear, but I'll, I better shut up as well. I've been talking. No, I, I think it's well made, and so I, I think it comes right. To tell us what's wrong with our current approach, and we will then try and work it out. And it may be an independent member might be the right solution. I'm, I'm not convinced that would necessarily solve what deficiencies of any we have currently. Um, so who's somebody else? Um, Richard Davis. Perhaps this might be a bit flippant, but um, I was considering invi inviting one or two of my keener social media. Uh, local social media commentators to be the uh, independent member, perhaps, and they can, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're keen to uh, to scrutinise us uh, in a of 240 co uh, characters. They can uh, turn up and spend a bit more time doing so. Well, and of course, just to make clear, and I think we've got at least Evelyn from the Whitley Pump on it. There's nothing, we've done this in the past, there's nothing to prevent any member of the public um, asking questions. We're more than happy to, if they want to, sort of make a contribution or submission to them in the meeting. There's, we're trying to be open and inclusive like that. And we have done, as we well know in the past, members have spoken. So I don't feel that there's, there's no barrier or rude screen between ourselves and, and the public. If, if, if they've got points to make, we're very welcome to hear them. Um, Ellie Emerson again. Yeah, no, just on that point, Chair, I just think something else the Redmond Review touches but doesn't really recommend as such is, you know, in terms of the public understanding local authority accounts, you know, because it is very confusing and very difficult. And, it, you know, I think uh, perhaps Council Block was right that it didn't go that far enough, you know, and I don't know what the solution would be. I think there is a proposed statement that kind of simplifies how, you know, we present the accounts to to people and I know you know the team here have always cooperated when we do have requests from the public to come and have a look at our accounts even during Covid I think um, we've had requests and they've been fulfilled but I think that's an interesting point as well in terms of how the public understand you know um, so yeah just throw that in there as well. What, one thing we don't have again correct me if I'm wrong here is a sort of presentation this is to Adrian so for instance those of us on the policy committee a couple of weeks uh, last week I think it was the chief constable and, and police and crime commissioner came and presented to us annually we don't have anything quite like that with external auditor coming and presenting as if they're presenting to the public saying explain what you know what you've done what you've seen what's going well what's not going well obviously it's embedded in a report but it's not as a presentation which is easily digestible to to members members and the, and the public yeah so in the past we actually have at the request of the committee we have you know especially when there has been new members we're more than happy to kind of do a session which kind of talks the committee through what we think are the key risks within financial statements and public sector and also kind of the work we do and also some of the reports we do and the key stakeholders so again we're more than happy to do that at any point if the committee feels um, that that'd be helpful but I, but I wonder if that's just for committee, and this is, a, I suppose, a question to leader and or Michael Graham, that you know, we had a very lean, full council um, agenda two nights ago. And the idea of external auditor coming, giving a short presentation in, in language that everybody can understand to the full council would strike me as a, a good use of everybody's time. 
more than happy to do anything that you think would be beneficial for the you know, the wider council. So uh, we can kind of work through that with uh, Jackie and Peter in terms of how they how we think that might work. OK, anybody else wants to contribute to this item? Oh, um, leader again, leader Jason. Since since you mentioned the leadership, I, I mean, it, it's certainly something worth um, having a think about. I think one of the difficulties, and as Councillor Emerson has touched on, and Councillor Williams as well, is that, yeah, you know, in a sense, presenting things in a kind of simplified manner can be helpful, but sometimes it's not because things are not simple. You know, accounts are complicated and audit work is complicated. And, uh, you know, one can dumb it down to make it uh, more, more sort of broadly comprehensible and there's, there's a utility to that, but it should never replace the fact that, you know, we, we need to ensure that members of this committee feel fully and adequately trained in order to undertake their role in, in scrutinising the information and the detail that's put before them. So maybe the first step we should we should think about, Chair, and maybe you and I can put our heads together and have a think about it, is if there is a, a programme of training, maybe around specific issues rather than in the general. I think where we've done a bit of training in the past, it's often been uh, fairly general. These are the roles of the audit committee. Let's go through some of the principles and so on. Very helpful, important stuff, and that should be part of the course. But there are doubtless uh, particular issues that, let's say, you know, Councillor Williams or yourself or, or, or Councillor McKenna may wish to get more stuck into and want a more bespoke set of training provided to allow them to engage with those particular themes. Because every member will bring their own particular interests as well as their general interests. Mm. Um, and so maybe embracing those sort of particularities and unlocking the, the potential of members to get stuck into it is the best way to proceed in making the best utility out of this committee. Yeah, thank you for that. And, and just one for Adrian, just briefly, I don't know, you obviously see a number of audit committees around the park. Is the way we do our business comparable, different, um, egregious in terms of what we do, or are we asking the right sort of questions? I mean, it'd be interesting to hear about naming names or to shame anybody. Are we going about are the way we go about our business consistent with our, with our councils? Yeah, I think on the whole, it is, you know, it is chair. I think what we do see here is a good level of challenge and obviously the representation of the council is good across the, the kind of political spectrum as well. I think in terms of going back to the independent audit chair, so I have experience of that from some London boroughs. I think some of it, when I see it, it works really well. I think the people who generally take up the role or have seen take up the role and make the role work are people who have a real passion for what they do in terms of that particular area. And some of them have actually been, uh, had a significant experience of working in internal audit in the past or even lecturing in internal audit. I think on the flip side of that, I've seen examples where an independent chair has come in and actually the commitment from the chair hasn't been great. So actually, you find that over the audit cycle, actually, that most of the most of the committees are end up being chaired by the deputy, which then takes away from that particular role. So I think when I've seen it work, it works really well. And obviously when I've seen it hasn't worked again, it hasn't been particularly good. So I think there are kind of pros and cons on both sides. So it's certainly something mm. that would be interesting to take forward and kind of have a think about. Yes, that's helpful. OK, but so but you're not seeing anything in Reading, you think, good grief. You know, why? No, no. We... Um, that's reassuring, I hope. OK. Um, anybody else? I think I can't see anybody else indicating. So I think that's really helpful. So thank you for bringing the report. I think that's useful to us. And I assume, just to just conclude on this, I assume what will happen is they've reported into the government, the, the, the Ministry has said, said what their view is. This is going to happen to us, presumably. This is just, we won't have much view on it. I'm saying so. This is just going to be implemented at some point. So Paul Harrington question. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, in, in essence, yes. So um, recommendations which have been accepted by the government, they, they will happen in some form, but obviously the, the detail is to follow. And those recommendations, recommendations where they haven't fully committed to, we're expecting um, a more detailed response in the, um, in the spring. OK, thank you very much. For that. that was, I think, quite interesting stuff. So we go on. Um, uh, I need to dial off, Chair, but thank yes, you very much. Yes, thank you very much for coming. Appreciate you. Thank you very much. Okay, goodbye. Good night. So the next one I've got then is 10. Closing, are we still doing this? Closing financial accounts update. So Peter Robinson. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll keep this brief. I mean, we, we've mm. gone through quite a bit of detail already in item yeah. 8 that Maria and Adrian talked through. I mean, just in terms of where we are, as you know, signed off 1718, 
I think it seems to be going well, going better. Good feedback, as you know, from Marie and Adrian. Then um, we we did change our our view after discussions with with Adrian and Maria in terms of whether we handed over the current version of the 1920 accounts. And we what will happen? What we've learned from what we did with 1819 was handing it over early. Of course, they don't start the audit until we finish the previous year anyway. We've yeah. got to bring forward balances, and I think what we found is we're noticing things through the audit of 1819 that they're picking up so yeah. we're able to change it so it's more a more efficient way of, of yeah. working really and, and and reduces error and reduces costs and time of the audit so um things are progressing well and we're, we're on track to to finish and get this signed off by the end of march yes and so the reassuring thing is hopefully that's that's sort of in 19 the 20 catch that we're virtually catching up aren't we we should be yeah back i think we're sort of, it's sort of six months really and so we're yeah. sort of hoping to get back on track and we've already started talking about the pre-planning for 2021 because of course we, we yeah. need to sort of break this backlog and this cycle really yeah yeah um, uh, <coughs> um richard davis <coughs> thank you chair yeah it's, it's um it's good to hear what peter peter's just said um, but yeah, it's something that does concern the people of Reading, uh, and we we uh, we get challenged on it quite a lot. You know, we, yeah. probably, should, we probably should really. Um, that's fine, but um, there's you know because really that we're still we're still uh, in we're still experiencing some of the after effects of the initial um, qualified uh, audit back in I think sixteen seventeen. Yeah, that's um, right. Then you know. Uh, despite the fact that since then things are gradually getting back to back on track, and, and you said uh, you said so uh, yourself just then, is that the you know there is a cumulative um, there's a cumulative impact to that, and again, you know, and, and that you know we really ought to look at what's you know year on year um, the audits are, should be quicker and and cost less, frankly. Um, yeah. So and, and that that is happening, and that's what I want I want people to recognise that. And yes, it would have been better if sixteen seventeen hadn't have happened, but that that happened back then, and the story since then has been one of um, continuous improvement. And I think that's well, important to know that. Uh, yeah, I just want to sort of add to that. Though there's one thing that does concern me, and this is the bit that we picked up at the beginning with the internal audit reports Paul Harrington presented. We're still seeing quite significant concerns around major systems controls. And that's the bit I would like to thought we got that sorted now, because that was part of the real problem back in 1617. And we're still, he's still picking those up in the current quarterly audits. Again, correct me if I'm wrong on any of this. And that's what worries me still, that if we haven't got those fundamentals right, then they're still going to impact on 20 and particularly 21 year ends, because we're still going to get up these, these sort of very major concerns about the, the, the reliability of our controls. Again, correct me if I misunderstood that, but that's, that's, that's my worry. Peter, Paul, you go. Uh, thank you, Chair. Chair you know, just a slight misunderstanding. So, yes, historically we have um, raised concerns over some of the key financial systems, but for this year they're all scheduled to be reviewed in quarter four, so we haven't yet done them. And I think what I was stating when I was reading my quarterly report is that I expect and hope to find um, improvement. And um, anything we do find would obviously have implications on my and your assurance opinion. But the report you gave us, I'm just scrolling back to it now. So the report you gave us earlier. Um, so this is, oh, yes, there was a lot, all the orange, the, all the sort of limited um, um, assurance over a number of the different systems. That that was what concerned me. So that is current, but not, that's not retrospective. Yeah. But that, that's correct, but the real big ones are the financial system. So it's your, it's your accounts payable, accounts receivable, general ledger, bank rec, those mm. areas, and they're due to be um, reviewed starting now. Starting now. Um, gosh, lots of people indicating. So, Jackie, you want to go next? Um, yeah, I was literally just going to say pretty much what Paul had said in terms of the underpinning issues with the statement of accounts weren't to do with SIL or um, some of the other things that were the limited assurance reports on, on Paul's highlight, uh, on update report rather. They are to do with those um, 
underpinning systems, the AP, the AR, the journals, the reconciliations. So, um, and as he says, th those are due to come up and we've got the, the next report on the agenda, which is around the improvement yeah. programme, which, which kind of gives some context about where we are with, with some of those things. OK, lots of people indicating, so we'll try and shoot around. So, um, should I just go back to Paul Parrington first, then Josh Williams? Sorry, I haven't taken my hand down, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, Josh Williams. Shall I go? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll, I'll try and be brief. On, on a slightly different tack, I just want to talk about the messaging. For example, around the 1920 account. So back in July, we were told, the end of July, we were told they'd be available in late August. So that's a month away. And then in, in early October, we were told they'd be available um, at the end of October. So again, it's just like a month away and yet they're still not here. Now we're told they'll probably be available April 2021. Now, I don't want to particularly criticise the delay. There are reasons for that delay. It's worrying in of itself, but that's not really what I wanted to talk about. I guess what I want to talk about is that constantly shifting goalposts and messaging. So as a member of this committee, I'd prefer a much more realistic estimate of when they're going to come. They feel as though they might have been a bit hopeful in the past. Uh, things are going to come up. Things are going to come up from the external auditors. Um, COVID may have hit the finance department very hard and it may have put a lot of delays in. But it's very hard for this committee to hold these uh, financial deadlines to account because they just shift every single time. So I prefer a much more realistic goal which we can then really robustly challenge when it doesn't come through uh, rather than a different goal every time we meet. Uh, does that make sense Chair? Feels a bit harsh to me. Um, well, it wasn't meant to, I think I've overdone it if I'm being harsh because yeah. I imagine the delays are entirely reasonable but it's it's that constant shifting of delays that has uh, that has meant I don't think we're holding anyone to account particularly over it. Peter. I mean, I, I can understand your frustration and the. I mean, in terms of what we've done here, it was a conscious decision. We could have handed the 1920 accounts over. I think what we felt based on what we've done in for 18, 19 is handed them over probably to they were done. But actually, we're, we're making changes now that actually if we'd have delayed that, we could have mm. changed them before we handed them over. So I think I can see your frustration. It's really a change in tack after having discussions with um ey mm. so what we're looking at is is it's not sort of a delay in progress per se it's a delay in approach and in effect to make the audit slicker more efficient and more effective and save costs really because actually they would look at those core documents uh and audit and say these these are the changes you've got to make so we'll we're, we're still making check based on what we're learning for 1819 we're updating 1920 as we go so we could have handed over something earlier but they're going to be a better set of accounts when we do hand them over yeah that makes good sense to me um josh is going to come back on that one are you happy with that um, briefly yeah i think i think maybe i didn't speak very clearly and i wasn't speaking my mind very clearly i am homeschooling a six-year-old i should uh, throw in um it's it's not the delay as such, and there may be very good reasons, yeah. just as uh, Mr. Ramos has explained. But this is not the first delay. This is one of uh, one of a few delays, and they uh, they may have all had good reasons, but we just keep getting delays with good reasons. Um, so I guess my point stands that a much more realistic set of goals, and then being held to account over those, would be preferable to me. Um, but I, I, I've said my piece and I'm very happy with the answer in this case. Thank you, Chair. C can I suggest there's a couple of points in there we just pick it up in part two when we stop recording. There's a couple of thoughts I have on that one and it might be worth just, just playing with those, but I think probably uh, in camera. OK. Um, what's going on? Paul Harrington, are you trying to indicate, Paul? No, send a quick message. No? OK. Um, anybody else wants to comment on this? Nope. OK, so thank you, Peter, for that. So that's um, the final issue. Well, I think we know where we are now. And then I think that then flows into item 11, which is the implementation of the financial improvement programme, which I think will presumably be, uh, well, it says Chris Tiswell. T Tiswell, is that right? Or is it Peter again? Uh, Chris, you are here. So apologies. Right, sorry. Chris, yeah. Yep. Uh, then, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, 
If I want, just cover the points you raised before about item four on Paul Harrington's report uh, and just echoing the comments made earlier. Um, within the finance improvement programme, there are deliverables, initiatives around AP, AR, intercompany, purchasing cards and uh, bank reconciliation. So those areas that were highlighted as amber in, in Paul's report are part, part of that programme. Uh, so they're improved, including the improvement programme, but also the audit tracker and both those are in that plan. So both of those sets, that, that those four or five sets that Paul was talking about are, are included. Paul's also part of the Finance Transformation Board that manages the improvement program as well. So he's cited on the work that's been undertaken. Um, and as far as that, that's concerned, they're monitored and managed and um, have a timeline for completion. That's just to give you some assurance that those areas that have been picked up are, uh, are included as well. And I think on the, the AP side, where there has been progress as an audit schedule to start in February, I think according to your plan, Paul, anyway. So just to, to take, take you through the paper, um, it's on page seven, uh, 171 of the pack. Uh, second update to this committee, the first one being in October, and it's now a, a standing agenda item. The format of reporters is as it was uh, in the past and previously submitted. Uh, it contains some background around the programme, uh, its areas of activity and interest, uh, but there's also an update for each of the six work streams indicating progress against the deliverables. And each work stream also shows the related audit tracker recommendations and progress against those. So just some, just a few points I wanted to pick up on all of those work stream areas, there has been progress and you can see the number of deliverables that were in the last report and there are now and there is improvement. And three of those, that's um, AP and AR uh, and um, chart of accounts work streams will be completed by the 31st of March. They're virtually completed now, so those areas will be completed. Um, the final accounts and reconciliation work stream is subject to the the conversation and the paper before that um, uh, Peter Robinson introduced uh, and there's timeline around those and the, the final work streams around the finance system which is scheduled to be completed by the end of this year. So from my perspective there's good progress to be made um, around those work streams and the audit tracker recommendations. You can see there's a number of those are now green and they're accelerating uh, and hopefully that a lot of those will be removed, certainly the green ones for, for the next report. Um, and the RAG rating um, around those is showing a, a, an improvement from the last report that was presented. So I'm happy to take any questions uh, and uh, the recommendation is to note the report, Chair. Thank you, Chris. Um, I've got one question. I'm looking somebody else wants it. So it's, it's a challenging question and it, it might be difficult for you, but maybe you and Peter will answer. So my worry is this, in the last couple of years, quite late in the year, Paul Harrington comes in, does his audits of the major financial systems and concludes, again, forgive me if the terminology is not quite right, but basically very limited assurance. We've still got big issues around controls. What I'm hoping you'll say to me is that is not going to happen this year. As a result of this programme, those issues have been resolved and when the internal audit look and subsequently external they're going to be more than happy and place high relative confidence on the major systems is, is that going to happen uh, as far as i'm concerned the direction of travel is positive uh, <laughs> well it's a very diplomatic answer chair <laughs> um there is more work to do around the end-to-end -end processes and process redesign to improve them but the basic part of the first phase of the change programme was to get the basics right um, and I think that's going to be the case. Certainly the recommendations that Paul has produced uh, have been responded to and a number of those have been delivered so I suspect that his, his level of his insurance will have, assurance will have improved. Peter, do you want anything to add to that or are you going to maintain diplomatic silence? No, I think I'm fine, yeah, I'm fine with that, yeah. OK, so direction of travel, we're on the journey, but our expectation should be managed carefully in terms of what we think will happen by the you know, this current financial year. And we will not be completely there yet, but we're on the way is what you're selling to us. Selling to us. I, I, I think that um, the changes that have been made um, are, the, are the right ones. I think the important thing for the change programme is to make sure that those changes remain and that those processes and controls remain and are operated in the right way so that 
people don't slip back into old practices. Yes, yes, that's and, an important point. So for, yeah, for that, me, that's exactly what has happened, doesn't it? Yeah. And, and that's where the risk is. So each of the work streams where things around accounts payable um, and accounts receivable, there is almost a compliance framework that comes right at the end. So whether that's regular reporting on exceptions, whether it's monitoring what actually happens, that compliance framework is a last step to make sure that those controls are maintained and it operates in the right way. OK, that's helpful. Emmett McKenna. Yes. So you've kind of preempted exactly what I was going to reinforce, that it's lovely to have fixed some of the historic issues, but we've seen in the past where we can create a system which will work for the moment with the staff you currently have trained, but then six months on when we've got new staff coming in, the training's not there, the compliance framework and the attention slips. So that's why I'd be particularly keen to have something forward for the phase two element, which you're going to, which is to streamline. Yep. So I'm perfectly happy with the direction of travel, the emphasis that's there, I think we're in the right directions. And then it's just the embedding part because we've had an uneven journey. We'll leave mm, it mm, diplomatically mm. there. Mm. The, the, the next stage for me is, um, as part of that second phase, is looking at the performance metrics that I want to see in place and the reporting around those. Uh, and that's going to be critical to make sure that uh, the momentum is maintained, but change is then embedded, as you, as you suggest. So, and um, that's the next stage for me when those work streams are coming to the end at this stage anyway, that that's in place. OK, that's really helpful. Um, I can't see anybody else indicating. No. OK, Chris, thank you for that. It's really helpful. That's a, it's a key one for us. So we'll obviously be watching it extremely closely. But thank you. Thank you for that update. Um, so. Next one is item 12, implementation of audit recommendation tracker. So um, oh, I see it's Jackie's going to introduce this. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, and this kind of flows on from um, Chris's uh, report because obviously a lot of the recommendations that um, he's been tracking in, in that report and which have informed those work streams are currently still in this tracker. So, um, it's the format of the report is as previously um, since the last report, there have been 34 new recommendations added, including all of those uh, recommendations in respect of the reports. Uh, Paul Harrington um, brought to your attention earlier in the evening. Um, 16 have been removed um, as they were completed and reported last time, which leaves us with 137 on the appendix. Um, of those, 33 are complete and would be removed at the next reporting point. Um, and uh, para 4.7, for um, you can see the proportion that are reporting as complete and green um, in total are 50%. Um, and the direction of travel in terms of um, the numbers that are, are green and the numbers that are amber um, are um, going up in one instance, the green um, uh, instance and, and going down in terms of the number that are uh, being reported as amber, which is a positive uh, direction. So um, really just to um, consider the report um, from members' perspective and um, I will endeavour to uh, answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much for that. So, Emma McKenna's the first up. Um, so, I've got a few of them just to double check on. So, on page 186, uh, tracker 33, which is a gift policy, which is marked for complete in December, has that been communicated to all staff? as it says to do so in January? Um, I'm, I'm going to um, ask um, Mike, if he's still on the call, um, whether that's happened, um, the monitoring officer. Um, I'm, I don't know that it has, if I'm perfectly honest, but Mike might tell me I've missed it. 
I don't think it has unless it's been included in the recent mm. circulation of updated um, HR policies, which has gone round, but we could confirm and come back to you. Yeah, so it's just for me that the action wouldn't be complete until no, the policy is actually yeah. put through. Yeah. That's OK. Uh, I've got a question on. Recommendation 71, which is the cemeteries and crematoriums, which is sort of linked to the next one, is that if we could have a bit of detail coming forward, we have a new member of staff starting in August effectively who wants to do a branch and review. So it, even if that information is provided to councillors to give us some reassurance separate to this process that actually action is going forward and it's not just been parked. No, that's fine. Um, uh, where's the next one? I think it's 120. There's quite a few. Oh, geez. Yes, 115 on page 198, which corresponds to the stores contract. So that's a question with legal effectively. It's been chased several times. Can someone pass them the contract? Well, I haven't seen that, but I will pick that up. Thank you, uh, Councillor McKenna. Yep, that's fine. And I think that's it for the moment. There will be a lot which will come back to the next meeting when the information governance unit is set up and can have some timelines. And thank you. Sure. Um, well done. You're very much, Councillor McKenna, very much our terror on this track, which is which is just a job. It's what we need, actually. It's really good that you're making your business. Anybody else? Well, I don't see. Okay, that's fine. So, so thank you very much for that, Jackie Yates. Um, that was helpful. Um, and I think we're going to move on to. Oops, sorry, Adam. Um, we move on to um, item 13, which I think actually is the last item, isn't it? Um, housing benefit and council tax support scheme. So I think the idea is that we will do this um, uh, an open item to uh, sort of get as far as we can in um, in, in public. Um, so Sam Wills, I've got down to introduce. Thank you, Chair. Um, you Sam. are. Poor Sam's been sitting here all through the last two hours waiting for this her moment of glory. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the report's proposing the continued use of the council's risk-based verification process for the next financial year. And I'll just give you a, a brief background on why this process was introduced and the benefit, benefits it provides. So risk-based verification was introduced just over 10 years ago following recommendation from the Department of Works and Pensions. It allows us to streamline the process of new claims and for both housing benefits um, and council tax support, enabling customers to receive decisions sooner and helps mitigate the risk of fraud entering the system. So we're required to have a policy in place detailing the risk profiles, the verification standards which apply, and minimum number of claims to be checked. Um, the policy must be reviewed annually and it's, it's considered good practice for the policy to be examined by the authorities audit and governance committee. Um, there are no changes to the uh, policy in front of you from the, the previous year. Um, and the policy sets out the arrangement for verifying the evidence needed to support claims. This verification is an automated process. It sits alongside our online application form. So it risk scores new benefit claims and categorises them as either low, medium or high risk, which enables speedier processing of low risk claims and more intense verification activity on, to be targeted on claims presenting with potentially higher risk of fraud and error. So risk scoring means officers can focus resources on um, new claims um, and you know, remove that risk. Um, claim processing times. Um, under normal circumstances where we have queries or concerns over identity, we, we do carry out advanced level checks. Um, but obviously, as a result of COVID, um, we have implemented the DWP's um, principle, trust and protect, which obviously supports the safety of claimants um, and local authority colleagues when processing these claims. Um, and where we have a, a, a policy in place using risk-based verification and that it continues as normal during the current crisis. Um, so the risk category assigned indicates the evidence required from um, those customers that being treated in line with trust and protect principles. And we just must be able to ident identify in a future point 
ordinary claims that have been processed under this approach. So the requirement um, for authorities that have adopted the risk-based verification process, uh, which include the risk categories, shouldn't be made public due to the sensitivity of these claims. Um, and whilst the appendices are exempt from publication, this report's open to allow us to be transparent about the fact that we use this approach. Um, the policy ensures that housing benefit and local tax support claims are processed quickly, quickly and efficiently, enabling residents to sustain their tenancies with a minimum impact on their requirement to provide evidence to support their claims. It ensures a fair and consistent approach to claim processing while protecting the financial stability of the council um, by safeguarding against fraud entering the system. Um, so this policy is just a seeking agreement of the continued use of that approach um, with no changes to the current policy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, Josh Williams indicating. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, thank you very much for that presentation as well. Um, I remember this coming a year ago and I didn't fully understand it and I went away and read up a little and I understand it a little better now. Uh, and thanks for your explanation. I think I've, got, I've just got one question and that is we, we buy in software for, um, I'm looking at my other bit of, uh, two and a half K a year software and support that generates this um, risk-based verification outcome. How reliable and accurate are the results that that software gives us? If you just tell us how, how is that accuracy assessed and um, approximately what level of accuracy does it give us in its results? So um, the, the system we use um, provides a number of reports um, and there are essentially baselines um, that we monitor against to ensure that we are getting um, the results that, that we um, that we estimate we should be and that's obviously based on um, uh, historic um, trends, um, other authorities. Um, I couldn't tell you exactly those figures off the top of my head, um, but happy to look at that reporting and, and share um, that information with you. But we do build the baselines into into it to um, highlight if if things are, you know, going astray, if there's too many low risk or perhaps too many high risk. Um, without pressing you for detailed numbers, which obviously wouldn't be fair now, would you categorise it as working well for Reading Borough Council? Yes, definitely. Um, I mean, obviously it, it, it massively impacts on resource in terms of the fact that um, it, it, it kind of like categories our, our fraud and error is, is relatively low um, and it means we can truly focus on the ones that we need to. Thank you very much. Thanks. Josh, um, Paul Harrington, can I just ask, when did you last review this system and what, what, what assurance did you give to us? Um, I can't remember off the top of my head when we last reviewed it, but it is due for a review next year. Um, but I can tell you when we previously reviewed it, it would have been given a positive assurance opinion. OK, that's helpful. Josh, you indicate again. Uh, no, I'm just not taking my hand down in time, Chair. Right. I apologise. Okay. That's right. Um, anybody else? No. OK, well, thank you very much. Sam, so apologies for making you wait quite so long. I should have brought you forward, but um, thank you for that. That's appreciated. Um, so I think what we're going to do now is say thank you very much to everybody. Um, we will say goodbye to any members of the public um, and anyone else that doesn't need to stay. And we'll just have a brief period in um, part two for a couple of items. Um, and I will turn off recording now so that we don't record part two. OK, so everyone that's leaving, goodbye. Thank you very much for coming along and we'll just have a short part two.